Okay, you can open the Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> I'm going to jump around today, but we'll be there mostly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I talked today about an interesting subject. Um, because I want to um, want to go a little deeper with it than what you normally hear on it. Uh, but we'll start with what maybe you normally hear on it and then go a little deeper. But, um, the subject is temptation. And um, the Bible has a lot to say on it. It has uh, many different meanings in the Word of God. Um, it can be confusing because in one part we read uh, that God cannot be tempted and in another part we read that Christ was tempted and you say well what does that mean that's, that's so confusing and um, God himself says that he tempts no man and then in another part it says that he tempted men and so uh, we have to look a little deeper at the meanings, and so we come up with different meanings of the word temptation. Uh, to be drawn away, to be enticed, um, to fall into, to uh, be led astray, uh, to lure, um, to be tried is a word for temptation. The crying of your faith is called a temptation. And so, uh, I have a thought in my mind about it that I want to uh, get into. Um, so, um, in these verses in 1 Corinthians 10 are dealing with it. So just follow along and, uh, and we'll go from there. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7 says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, but the, when it refers to some of them there, so I'm about the children of Israel in the wilderness, um, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. When did they do that? They did that when Moses was up in the mountain for too long, they thought, getting the Ten Commandments, fellowshipping with God, didn't come down, and they got weary, they didn't know what happened to them. They said, uh, make us an idol to Aaron. And uh, it's an interesting story to read. Aaron uh, tells him, give me all your earrings, and he melts it down, and, and he, he forms a calf, which was a god of Egypt, where they just came out of. And they still worshiped God, but they worshiped the calf. They needed a visible presence. Moses was gone. They needed a, a presence, but it wasn't God. It wasn't his representative. It was a calf representing a god of Egypt. And they began to have a feast, sacrificing to God, but also worshiping the calf as a represent, representation of God. Remember, they just came out of Egypt. They didn't, they didn't have the sound doctrine in their soul. Uh, but so they're doing this. <clears throat> so they had this big feast. And uh, Moses is still up in the mountain, and they're having this big feast. And it says they sat down and ate and drank and rose up to play. Well, there's an interesting mean, meaning to that, rose up to play. And it doesn't mean they were playing uh, cornhole, or, you know, squash, or a soccer game broke out. It was, they, they rose up to play in a sense of having fornication with each other. Uh, is a very interesting connection between <clears throat> idolatry and fornication. And it's something that uh, we, we would, might have a little trouble connecting today, but not really, if you look at it. Uh, what is uh, fornication, sex outside of marriage, or any sexual impurity uh, outside of the marriage institution? Um, today we see sexual immorality everywhere, everywhere, <clears throat> and it's so uh, thrown in our face on TV, entertainment, Hollywood, uh, 
that it's become the norm. Dress like this, look like this, doesn't matter what, what how skimpy your clothes get, it's what everybody does, nothing's wrong with it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it's tied into idolatry, where it has the same principle, let me draw you and entice you to my flesh by exposing myself. Well, this can apply to both men and women, but a lot to women with men. And if you read in Proverbs about the Proverbs, the woman in Proverbs 23 and other places, a strange woman that allures with her dress, her eyes, her beauty, it draws men down to the pit of death with her. Um, what, what are they drawing the men's attention to? The flesh themselves, not God. So, it, so that they themselves, without realizing it, that most women do it as a form of attention. I like the attention I'm getting, so I'll dress this way because society has taught me that if I dress this way or begin to remove my clothes, and by the way, when they rose up to eat and drink and play, they were naked. They were naked. Aaron told them to take off your clothes and do this. It's tied in with idolatry. So anyways, a woman does this, removes clothing, say, oh, it's hot in summer. No, but you know when you're doing it to attract attention to yourself or whatever. Uh, young, young women, young girls are being led to do this without even thinking about what they're doing. They don't realize what they're doing, but it's a twofold thing that's going on. Number one, they're drawing attention to themselves and enticing men, young men, to look at them and follow into a lust pattern with them. Number two, uh, they're, they're worshiping an idol themselves. They're making themselves a god or an idol instead of God because they're telling, look at me. And everything that we do as Christians is supposed to look to God. Look at God. But when you do that, you say, look at me. And I'm, this is not the message today. This is a base form of temptation. It's a base form. Sexual temptation is a base form of temptation. It goes from there. So, but, it, but it's the first thing mentioned here is what they did. Uh, <clears throat> neither let us tempt Christ. Here we go. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. How did they tempt Christ in the wilderness? Christ, we know, is the rock. He's the rock of our salvation. Deuteronomy, uh, God is a rock. His work is perfect. Uh, we are thirsty, the children of Israel in the wilderness. God, God brought water out of the rock. He hides myself in the cleft of the rock. God is the rock in the word of God. And God is Christ. Christ is God. And here Paul is telling the church at Corinth, do not tempt Christ as they tempted him, meaning God, the rock, in the wilderness. How did they do that? Can God provide a table for us in this wilderness? Can God furnish it? They tempted him, or tried God is the word really there. God cannot be tempted in a, in a sensual, immoral way uh, at all, but he can be tried. You can try, try God. They, just read the Old Testament. God's patience was tried over and over and over again. It's a form of temptation. You're trying to get me to do something by your actions. Temptation. So... They, they complained and murmured and they, they uh, told Moses they were sick of the manna that was coming down from heaven. And so God brought a plague amongst them of the serpents biting them. And they, they, they repented and they had to ask God, uh, ask Moses, do something, we're all dying here. And, and uh, Moses made a so God instructed Moses to make a serpent out of brass and put it on a pole and whenever people looked at it they would be healed. A, a picture of Christ, if you will, on the cross. And they were. But they, they, they tried God and, just, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither, verse 10, murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Uh, this is uh, uh, Korah. <coughs> And uh, murmuring against Moses, God's man, murmuring against the plan of God, and the earth opened up and just swallowed them up. And uh, 
Now all of these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come, meaning they were living in the end times. And wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Uh, this is an area of pride of a person saying, I can't be tempted, I can't fall, I can't be tried, I can't have anything, I don't have to worry about those things. Uh, verse 13, what I want to key on there, has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted about that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay? Uh, there is no temptation taking you but as such as is common to man, meaning that the trial, however you want to look at it, the temptation or the trial, uh, the enticement, whatever you're going through, is, is not unique to you. It has happened before. It's common to all men and women. Everybody goes through temptations and trials and tests and enticements from the devil. Even Jesus did in the temptation of the wilderness in Matthew 4. After fasting for 40 days, the devil comes and says, Turn these stones into bread. You're the Son of God. You're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Uh, and he waited on God for God to tell him to turn the stones to bread, not the devil to do it, but he was enticed to do it. Three, three different temptations in the wilderness. Cast yourself down, for the, his angels will, I've given a charge not to let you dash your foot upon a stone. Right? Angels to protect him. No, it is written. And uh, fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. There's an amazing temptation there with, with, with prosperity and with riches. And if you don't think it doesn't happen today, if it happened to Christ in the wilderness, it happens to Christians all the time. Prosperity temptation is one of the hardest temptations to fight against because it looks so good. It looks so good. And it's so inviting, and our minds quickly look at it and say, what is wrong with it? I don't see anything wrong with it, it will make my life better. But did God tell you to do it? It's the only question, is there anything wrong with being successful and being prosperous? No, there isn't. Paul actually said, I wish that you would prosper even as your soul prospers. The pro prosperity is fine. But if you don't include God in it, and then it becomes a form of idolatry. And, and, and it takes the place of God in your life. So, there's no temptation that we have faced that we say, oh, it's too hard for me. It says, no, there is none that there isn't a way of escape that God has made. By the way, um, I read one commentary that said, when, when you are tempted in an area, it's not like God scrambles and comes up with a way of escape for you, like an escape route. Oh, what are we going to do? We need an escape route. He already made the escape route before you were tempted. So, it's already ordained by God in every trial or temptation for you that there's a way out. Uh, how about if you look at uh, Joseph with Potiphar. He's a, he's a captive. He's commanded to work in a house and uh, part of his wife desires Joseph. And he could, he could have easily said, I'm a slave, I'm supposed to do what I'm told. She's telling me to have relations with her. I, don't, I guess I have to. There's no, I don't see any way out of this, blah, blah, blah. No, he fled. He, he ran out with his coat in her hand. He fled the temptation. It was a way out. When, when did it lead him? In prison? That, but that was... That was the plan of God. If you look at it all down the, the line, to where Joseph, even being sold into slavery by his brothers and then going into jail because he fled temptation, could have easily said, I don't understand the plan of God here. I don't understand. I did the right thing and here I am in jail. But if he didn't go to jail, he never would have 
had an answer to the dream and never would have became second in the kingdom of Egypt and never would have been able to re rescue his brothers and his father and restore it. And if you look at it from the end, from the beginning, it's like, wow. But if you see it from the beginning to the end, it's like, why is this happening to me? It's a, a temptation. A trial came. Now, look at this verse in 1 John 4, 1. <clears throat> um, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, many false prophets <clears throat> are in the world today. They teach us things, they tell us things, and they say they're from God, and they are not. And they entice us with things. Uh, different messages from false prophets to tempt us to do something and call it God, but it's not God. And so it's incumbent upon the listener, you and me, to discern truths, to not believe every spirit that comes along. And men, there are many Christians, and by the way, this, th these verses that we're talking about today, they're all directed towards the Christians. But Paul was talking to the church at Corinth, who were believers, about idolatry. Uh, what were the things he talked to them about? Fornication, idolatry, murmuring, and tempting Christ. They were doing all of them in the church at Corinth. And, he's, and he was saying, look at what happened with the children of Israel in the wilderness. You're doing the same thing in the church. And it was, he was at war, he said, it was done for a warning for you. Uh, <clears throat> but then he says, but there is a way out. There is a way out of it. There is a fleeing of temptation. There is a turning from it. There is a casting down of things. Believe not every spirit. Why? Because there are spirits behind the temptation. There are spirits, just like there was a spirit behind the idolatry of the children of Israel to make a calf and worship that instead of God because they were tired of waiting. There's a spirit behind the temptations that come against us as believers. And they go deeper than just, it, just uh, sexual temptations. They go much deeper than that. Although they, that can include that, but they go much deeper than that for the believer. They enter into areas where the attack is directly against us to be seduced away from God. Tempted to stop following God. Tempted to quit. Tempted to stop praising God. Tempted to stop following God. The spirit is behind it, and it comes along and it projects a temptation towards us or an offense or something that gets us upset about God and what he's doing, and it's all designed to draw us away uh, into an idolatrous relationship, even while we still say, I'm following God. And it happens in most Christians' uh, hearts, and it happens in their hearts. And sometimes it manifests itself, but sometimes it stays in the heart. But it's there if it's not dealt with. And it can produce devastating things. So I didn't put these verses up because we had a lot of verses, but I want to read, I want to read you these verses in James 1, verse 2. My brethren, who's he talking to again? The church, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Let's stop there for a second. When, when was the last time you counted it all joy when you fell into divers temptations? When was the last time like things were happening in your life? Trials, temptations, uh, different things that were hard in your life and you, and you counted it joy. And you say, that, that that verse shouldn't even be in the Bible, some of us would say. How in the world are you expect me to be joyful when this is happening to me? It does not make any sense at all. It is almost on the same level as love your enemies. How do you expect me to love my enemies when I hate them? How? It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, well, I don't understand how to do it. 
And, and then what we hear is we hear from the pulpit, love your enemies, and inside your eyes, and I can't stand that person. Forgive those, or you won't be forgiven. I can't forgive them for what they did. I struggle with this. And because you don't like that thought, that message, you are tempted to be led astray by a spirit of God. It's not fair. God can't possibly expect. How are you supposed to do that? You, you No. And mentally, you withdraw from God in that truth because of a spirit that is saying, God, God's not right there. God's not fair. This is impossible. How do I count it all joy? I'm falling into diverse, diverse, there's manifold, manifold of many temptations, many trials. You know, you, you know, when you have one of those weeks where you just feel like ending it all because so many things have happened, you said one more thing happened, I think I'm going to die. You go, did one more thing happen? Yes. Did you die? No. Well, I guess you could take it. I guess there was a way out. I guess God made a way of escape for you because you didn't die. If something doesn't change soon, I'm going to lose it. And, and yet this is the place we get to, manifold trials and temptations. And then we read this verse, count it all joy. And we almost hate the person who's saying it. Like, Pastor Jim, I hate you right now. It is saying, count it all joy. How am I supposed to be joyful? And you don't know what's going on in my life. No, I don't. Uh, but I know this, there isn't a temptation that isn't common to man, that hasn't happened to every man. So I don't need to know what's going on in everyone's life. I need to know that it happens in everyone's life. Manifold trials and temptations, particularly to the Christian. Because why? It is the Christian that the devil wants to draw away from his God. Because that's where you get your power from. So if he isolates the Christian from his God, then the Christian makes a path. Because just like the children of Israel, we need something to worship. Because it's in us. God, our, our representative of God is gone. He hasn't come back. Aaron, make us a God that we can worship. We need something that we can worship. This is human nature. I, I, don't, I don't like to worship a God I can't see or sense, and now I don't even have a representative to tell me about Him. Make us a God. And this is what happens to us when we don't understand the things of God in a verse like that, that we develop our own frame of reference, our own thinking about God, and we make ourselves a God, and we turn uh, the truth of God and make it fit into one of what we think is right. Or we'll excuse ourselves from the prom, from the verse or the command and say, it's not talking about me. You can't expect me to do that. I don't understand what I'm going through. But we forget that yeah, there is not a temptation that is not common to man that hasn't befallen him. That the God has not made a way out of it. There's a way out of every trial, every temptation. Even though the situation might not stop. But there's a way out for you. There is a way to experience joy in the midst of your trial. It is not saying here that, they, that God wants you to look at your trial as your source of joy. He's saying, I want you to have joy in your trial. Joy in the things you're going through. Joy in your temptations. I want you to have, be able to have joy in it. Why? Knowing that the, that the trying of your faith is what it says there. Let me see. Knowing this, verse 3, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and he sh it shall be given to you. Wisdom for what? Wisdom to understand how I can have joy in my trial. How do you expect me to have joy in the midst of all that's going on, God? Let me ask God for wisdom in this. Let me ask, but this is where many people stop. They don't want it. They don't, they don't ask God. They look at it, uh, uh, it's a trial, I hate it. How am I supposed to have joy? I can't. Uh, God's not fair here. I don't understand it. So we avoid reading those verses altogether. And then when it's brought up in a message like this, I don't like the message. I don't like the message today. I already tuned you out. I'm already at the beach. I'm already here and there. 
When's the message going to be over? What did he say? Something about joy? I don't know. Uh, when I have a mindset that says every single thing that happens to me, like Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God and have called according to His purpose. That's a conditional promise, by the way. It doesn't work good for everyone. It works good to those who love God and have called according to His purpose. Who is that? The body of Christ. So everybody else that's not a member of the body of Christ, I promise you can't say it to them. Don't say it to them. I have said people are going through stuff, they're not even saved, and they say, oh, but you know what? Everything is going to work together good. No, it's not. Not for you. No, it's not. So you want it to work together for good? Receive Christ. Become a child. And then all things will work together for good. How does God do that? I don't know, but it's His promise. How? Can I have joy when I have an expectation that everything that happens to me as a believer happens for a reason and that God already has a provision for it already before it even happens? Already there's a way out of it for me. Already God knows what's going to happen to me in it. Already He's going to keep me in it and He's going to get me through it. Already I have grace for it and mercy for it and love for it. Already it's there for me already. Instead of looking at the horribleness of the trial, and many trials can be horrible, I'm not diminishing it, but we need to look at the one who's but greater than the trial and above the trial and has made a provision for me to get through the trial. And what do I need? Patience. Let patience have her perfect work. Now what is patience? Waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. I'm not looking at the trial and how horrible it is. I don't like it, but I know God has a plan in it, and He's going to get me through it, and He's made a way out of it for me. And if the trial is a temptation that's trying to entice me in the form of immorality or sexuality, guess what I can do? Flee. The Bible already tells me what to do. I don't have to wait for God to tell me to do it. It already says, flee fornication. Flee it. Run away from it. Don't go near the Proverbs woman who, and I'm not talking about the 31 woman, I'm talking about the 23 woman, who was, who was enticing men to go with her to the pit of death. It says then, my son, flee her. Stay away from her. Don't be caught up in that. Right? There's a provision, there's a way out. Don't go into it. You have a problem with drinking, don't go to a bar room. It's just that simple. Oh, every time I'm around people drinking, I get tempted to drink. Well, then don't be around people who are drinking. Well, I have to stay home then. Then stay home until, until you're able to handle it. Oh, I have a problem with taking drugs and all my friends take drugs. Guess what? Give up your friends for a while. Sorry to say that. Oh, you can't expect God to want me to give up my friends. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Because you know what? It happens to just about every Christian when they become saved. The friends that you had in the world, kind of like, shh, they're no longer your friends because they don't like your life anymore. So they don't want to hang around with you. So generally it's not a problem with you hanging around with them. They say, I don't even want to be with them. He's, that, he's, he's religious now. You know? But if there are issues in our life that tempt us, we have a, a provision, flee. Run away from it. Stay away from it. Don't get involved in it. Go the other way. Cast it down. Go to prayer. But I still want to look at something deeper today on this temptation thing and go back to what we were saying. Many believers are tempted in their minds uh, mentally and it becomes a spiritual infection for them so that they, in, in a sense, become sick as a Christian. And it's, it's, it's to... It's worshiping an idol that they're not even aware that they have in their life. They're not aware of it because they don't hear messages like this which make us aware of it. They don't, they don't want to, they stay away from messages that are hard to understand, so they stay away from it. But, but, but there's a temptation, there's a spirit, believe not every spirit, there's a spirit and a, and a trying of our faith that is designed to get us to quit our Christian walk. To get us to not uh, be, on, be on fire as much as we used to be. To get us to settle on our leaves in our Christian walk and not uh, be all, you know, 
um, following God, do, I want to know God more, I want to pray more, I want to learn His Word more. And after a period of time, uh, you talk to that same person and you say, what happened? Do you still pray? No. When was the last time you read the Word? I don't know. Have you, do you know where your Bible is? No. Nope. you go to church? I did on Christmas. You know? Are you a believer? Yep. Yeah. Do you know that you're saved? I think I am. What happened? A spirit. They believed a spirit. A spirit that came along and enticed them and drew them away through seduction. Uh, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. We are commanded by God as His children, the believers, to try a spirit that comes along and tries to convince us about something from God while sound, sounding godly, while making sense to you, while reasoning with your mind and saying, it, it, God's not right here, God's not fair here. They can't expect you to do that. Go this way in your thinking. And we need to be able to refute that and rebuke that and say, no, I will hear from God in this. I will open a verse like this that says, count it all joy when you fall into it. say, what do you mean by that, God? How can it be? How can I, I count the, the, a, a sickness in my life uh, or, or stress or my son being an addict or a loss of a loved one? How can I count that joy? I'm not count, God's not saying count that joy, count it all joy, all the things that happen to you as joy. Considering this in Hebrews, Jesus Christ, right? Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him, all right, uh, endured the cross. Was the cross a temptation? Was it a trial? Yes. What, did he give himself over to God's will in it? Yes. Was it the plan of God? Yes. Was it a pleasant thing to behold and look at and consider? No. Imagine Jesus living as a human, trusting God, but seeing crucifixions left and right as he walked through the, the, uh, the providences all the time. Romans were crucifying people all the time. He knew what was going to happen to him. And, and maybe he heard the same word that he said, and to count it all joy. Uh, you want me to count that joy? How am I supposed to count that joy? No, count it. He, he endured it. He endured the trial. He endured it for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? When you endure the cross, and you go through the cross, when you come out the other side, you'll be sitting at my right hand forevermore. There is a provision and a promise and a plan in the trial and in the temptation for you to have uh, a closer relationship with God, a stronger relationship with God, and a reward from God uh, for enduring the temptation. And then, so that, that is what we count joy. That is what I look at and say, I have joy. I'm going through something difficult, but God's already got it under control. I, 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 God already has a plan for me in it. God will give me peace that will pass my understanding in it. God will give me a love that goes beyond knowledge, and God will give me a joy that I can't even tell you about. It's unspeakable. But I just know everything's going to be okay. People look at the world and what's going on and, the, and, and get all frustrated and upset over the gas prices and the food prices and the Ukraine thing and the COVID thing and all of that. And they get in despair and this thing. And a spirit has come along and tried to convince them, worry, it's the right thing to do. Worry, worry, worry. You should worry and take these things serious. Don't be like the people that are, that are just talking about it lightly and not thinking about it. Uh, but where's the joy of God in it? Where is the joy of God in all of that? Is there a joy in God as we go through all these things? Yes, there is. It's knowing that God has it all under control. And that it's not going to affect my eternal position whatsoever, no matter what happens in this world. That as we read on Wednesday, that God made a promise way back in Genesis that, that don't worry about it when they tell you that the earth is going to melt or it's going to get so cold we won't be able to live because God made a promise to Noah and to all generations that as long as there is an earth, there will always be night and day, winter and summer and spring and harvest and so on. And that's his promise. And so for those people who are running around 
telling everybody to worry that the earth's getting too hot and we're all going to melt in a frying pan because it's going to get so hot and there will be no more winter. No, God, that's going against God. It's believing in the spirit that on the surface makes sense, but in reality, according to what God says, it's an idolatrous thought. It's exalting a thought above the knowledge of God. And that's a temptation to draw you away from God. Much of the temptations that we go through are really things, they're things in and of themselves, but it's something that is designed by a spirit, which is demonic in nature, and is designed to take you away from trusting God. So you quit on God. You turn back and follow God no more like they did in John 6. I don't like what he's saying, I'm not going to that church anymore. I'm not going to listen to that. It is too hot for us. Who can understand this? People of God can. When they when they just go to the Word and dig deep and find out what God's really saying here. How can I be joyful today? I'm joyful because I know, even though all this turmoil is going on and all these things are happening, that I'm coming out the other side and I'll be with God. No matter what happens. Uh, the gas prices go to seven dollars a gallon. Guess what? I'm still going to have God. He's still going to be in control. The world is my world is not going to end. I might not be able to go on trips anymore, but I, oh well, oh well. You know, we still have God. There's something deeper, something bigger, something in our lives that the devil is going off of besides the surface temptations that we all face, which we have a way out of. And it's to mistrust God and to fall away from God and to stop following God and to listen to the Spirit that comes along. And you know what the Spirit comes along like? A wind. Like the Bible warns us, it says, be not carried about with every wind of doctrine. What is that? It's a Spirit that comes along and tries to teach you something. And the thought, the, te the teaching is to not trust God and His Word and what He says. To stop following after this Christian thing and you start doing what you want because the world's going to, 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 to hell anyway. But what's the difference? Live, prank, and party and have a fun time because it's all going to end. As a spirit will convince you in a more subtle way in your heart to not trust his word and what he says, to misunderstand what he's doing. But behind that spirit is the worship of an idol. An idol back then. Like, like the golden calf, guess what it was? It was a calf made of gold. Right? They took their earrings, they melted it, and Aaron formed the calf. And it's so funny when Moses said to Aaron, what did you do? What did you do when I was up in the mountain? What, what is this? He goes, it's amazing. They gave me their earrings and I put them in the fire and a calf came out. <laughs> but then you read that the chapter and it says that Aaron designed the calf and put it in the fire. He made a, a template of the calf and, and then put the gold in the fire with the template and gold melted and out came the calf. But Aaron said, no, 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 just look, like this miracle happened. We just melted the gold and the calf came out. It just happens to look like the God of Egypt that we all, everybody worshiped in Egypt. And, and they all had a party and idolatry, and in that idolatry, they all took off their clothes and fornicated, and God killed 23,000 people in one day. Because there was a wage to pay for it. He wanted to destroy all of them. And Moses interceded for him, and he ended up 23,000 who refused to obey Moses when he said, stop doing this. There were those that said, no, we will not stop. There's a story of a man who right in front of Moses took a woman and started fornicating with her right in front of him. And, and, they, and, and uh, Aaron's grandson went in with his sword and just killed them both instantly. And God rewarded them for it when he recognized what they're doing is they're, they're assaulting God and His holiness through committing fornication to an idol in front of an idol. So idolatry and fornication are really tied together, and it's the same spirit that's in the world today, by the way. Uh, and be careful of that. We need to teach our young people about what is happening when, when the world is promoting uh, 
promiscuity and immorality and saying it's fine. It feels good to do it. Dress the way you want. Expose yourself however you want. You're not hurting anybody. And it's hot and all of that. You are worshiping an idol. And that idol many times is yourself. Because you're drawing attention to yourself instead of God. <clears throat> and that's idol worship. And most people don't even realize it. But it is. And God takes it seriously. And there's a way out of all of that. There's a way out of every temptation and trial that we face in this world as Christians. God has a strength for us. He has a provision for us. So we cannot say, like some people say, and maybe if you've said it before, this, there's no condemnation. Uh, you know, like the devil made me do it, or I couldn't help myself because after all, that's what I am. I can't help it. I'm tempted. I couldn't help it, so I ate it. Somebody put a whole bag of Oreos in front of me. I couldn't help it. I ate every one of them. What am I supposed to do? I like Oreos. I flee from the Oreos. Throw them away. Don't go to the store and buy Oreos. But we have, a, we have an option. We have that choice. We don't have to sit there and say it. So you say, don't buy Oreos anymore. I, I, it's a weakness of mine. Okay. So there's no Oreos in the house. Guess what? I can't eat the Oreos. Flee it. Flee it. I recognize that I could have a weakness and don't be like the ones who say, oh, I'm strong, nothing can happen to me. Recognize it and stay away from it. And don't enter into it. And certainly don't, don't promote it by the way you behave or the way you dress. Certainly don't enter into idolatry and causing people to follow a false god instead of the true god. So that there's a lot to consider with temptation, but think about your hearts today and where you are in your heart with God. And if there is anything, we read it on Wednesday, Lord, if I have a secret sin, cleanse me from it. A secret sin, a sin that I'm not aware of. Is there an idol in my life that I'm following instead of God? Show it to me. There's no condemnation. God will show it to you and you can rebuke it and cast it down and flee from it and follow and serve God. But if you don't, don't ask and you follow after it in ignorance, God will bring a message like this and you have a chance to hear it, but you can also just pray and ask God for it. Like, is there something in my life that I'm exalting higher than you, God, including my flesh, including my body, including what I want to do with my life, including my will? including my, my thinking, my thought life that tries to come exalt, exalt itself against your knowledge. And when it does, I become my own idol. And I begin to worship my own self without even realizing that I'm doing it. And it, it could be in my heart as a cockatrice egg and I'm not aware of it. And so I ask God, show me. And then show me how to have joy in my life every day. There's nothing worse than an angry Christian. And you're, uh, Christians are going around angry because their life is miserable. You know, you're a Christian and your life is miserable. Well, you don't have my life. Yes, but well, we, well, tell me about it. Is it different than anybody else's? No, we all have trials. And we can get angry at the trials and we can get frustrated and we can go around with an angry confidence on and being miserable. You say, are you a Christian? Where's your joy? I don't have joy in this trial. I expect me to have joy. Have God do something good for me and then I'll have joy temptation of Christ in the wilderness. I'm sick with this manner. Have God bring me meat and then I'll worship them. Instead of trusting God for the manner that they had to eat and thanking them that they were out of bondage for 400 years. The perspective of the heart of man is what God looks at. Does he know that they want meat instead of man? Yes. That wasn't the issue. The issue was they were lifting up their food to their, nest, to their bodies more than they were to God who delivered them from bondage for 400 years. So be careful uh, of what you're looking at and what you're allowing to be worshipped in your heart. Check with God if it's okay uh, that what I'm thinking of. If it's not of God, He will show you. He will tell you. And it's, it's something that we need to cast off, as good as it might seem to us. Check with God first. What is wrong with that? Check with God first. Is this good for me to think about? Is this good for me to look at? Is this good for me to do? 
and then you'll find joy in everything you go through because God will be in it in everything you do. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, let's go. say um, that uh, there are areas in our life where we are worshiping an idol instead of you. Lord, willingly or unwillingly, knowingly or unknowingly, Lord, or we have done it in our thought life and our attitude towards our call, our walk, because we're upset or we're things that have happened, temptations and trials that have come, Lord, and we have focused more on them than we are on you. They've consumed us, they overwhelm us, Lord, and uh, they weary us. And we're not to be looking at them, to be looking at you, Lord. And when we look at you, that's where our joy comes from. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I can rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice in God and what He's doing. And then as I go through trials, I realize that God is with me in it and will be there at the end of it and have a provision for me for it. And so I can have joy. We repent for not having the joy that we should have as our children, Lord. And we would ask for it restored in our hearts as David did. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. The joy of our salvation should be above anything else we go through in life. But we have forgotten. We have turned away from it. We have focused on things, Lord, that the lust patterns in our, our five gates see and look and feel and sense and touch, Lord, and we allow those things to be more important than and I'll walk with you, Lord, so we can repent for it. And Lord, it is, as hard as this message might have been, it was good for us, healthy for our souls to hear it, Lord, to correct us in the areas, to get us on the right path in our thinking, to restore joy in our soul, Lord. I don't want to be Christians who have a, a sour countenance and a sad uh, outlook on our lives, Lord. We have, we have all the hope in the world in you, Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As hard as things might be in it, we can still rejoice in it, Lord. For anyone watching or here that have, ne have never received you as Savior, Lord, best way that they would reach out to you right now to want to know you. You need to know God to know his love, to know his forgiveness, to know his mercy. Else this message would do nothing but condemn you. Reach out and know God and you not receive a Savior. We all need a Savior and Christ is our Savior. And he died for your sins, so call upon the Savior today. Don't, don't put it off. Simple prayer, dear Lord Jesus, I want to know you as my Savior and I receive you today. And Father, we love you and we praise you today. In Christ's name, amen. Okay.